Let's just lift our voices and give him the fruit of our lips tonight. Let's worship Yahweh. Let's worship him. Just go ahead and worship him. Oh, Lord, we exalt you. We thank you, Father. We bless your holy name, Father. There is none like you. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We thank you. Father, we exalt you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are the hallowed one. Father, you are the most exalted one. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We worship your holy name. Be thou exalted, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. May we be seated. Good evening once again. And I bid us welcome to another session in the School of Virtue. Um, we've been on a series at second at the second birth deformities at the second birth and um, we've laid the foundation for uh, every build up with regards to this teaching and I want us to get up and get our writing materials and also listen attentively as we continue in this series. This teaching is an ingredient that will change the course of the way we see Christianity being practiced today. How it has departed from the way it used to be. Hallelujah. Restoring the ancient landmarks is one of the core values of the Friends of God Fellowship. And by the grace of God, we will do this, God helping us, so that the ancient landmarks be restored. Brethren, let's get ready for tonight's teaching. And join me as I welcome Pastor Kola, our teacher once again for tonight. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Yes, he is. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Yes, he is. Okay, you know, when we commenced the current trend of teaching in our midweek service, I remember we had a, we started with outsourcing. And we had a few sessions on outsourcing. Then we went on to learn about rediscovering wisdom. And this is the the second birth. I'm very grateful to God. I feel very um, grateful and I feel honored. Okay. I feel grateful to God and I feel quite honored that about the things that the Lord is showing us. Listen, to, uh, I, it is clear to me that the things we are learning are things which are fundamental. They are things which I trust the Lord wants to use to reshape understandings, doctrines, and practices in the body of Christ. Some of the things we have learned are things that God himself opened our eyes to, and we are very, very grateful. And I just want you to know that we are honored to be at a point where the Lord is opening our eyes to things which we need to know, things which are very, very important. And in a number of instances, in quite a lot of the instances, things which need to change. So I want us to take it seriously. And I do not always want us to take the things which are said just because they've been said from the pulpit. I want us to be like the um, Berean Christians, that when these things change the things we've always had, to go back and check and search and research, you know. But clearly, God wants us to move from points of inaccuracy to accuracy. And we're going to continue with this 
series tonight, which I, I, I reckon will, this will be the second and the final part. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we exalt you. Lord, completely behind the cross, I submit myself. Lord, that dying completely to the cross, that the resurrected life of Christ will come alive by the things we will hear and the things we will share today. And your eternal course, your eternal counsel will be established. Lord, let the light of heaven flood our hearts and our lives and chase away every darkness. Let power come behind your word to equip us to do that which you expect us to do. Thank you, mighty Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Deformed at second birth, why many Christians remain sinful, carnal, and worldly? Um, I want to thank God for the Zoom audience, those who are following us on Zoom. I hope you are hearing me clearly. Praise the Lord. I also thank God for the Facebook audience. Now, if the technical can help me, I want us to move straight to that uh, PowerPoint which we had last week. And it showed two sinners' prayer. You know. And what we, why we saw those two sinners' prayer, that we could see clearly what happens at birth that creates a deformity in the spiritual existence of many born-again Christians. You know, last week, just for us to be able to get parallels, you know, when you look at the Bible, you see that God uses a lot of comparisons, sometimes with agriculture. He will say, a man went to sow. What God wants us to do in learning about the Bible is that he relates sometimes concepts of the Bible to things which we are used to every day so we can understand it. And so in order to go into this, last week God reminded us that in the process of giving birth to a child naturally, when that child has a deformity from the womb, those deformities are called congenital and they are very severe. And that God just uses it as a, an illustration so that we can see the weight of what we are talking about. So very quickly, I want to remind us about these two prayers. You know, we're looking at um, um, two sinners' um, prayers. I think I sent you technical. I think what you are projecting is from last week. I sent you... I, re, I, I read this, I reviewed it, and I sent you a, a, a new mail, which I... Please, can you get that mail and, and bring it up? So, essentially, and while they're bringing that up, you know, the first prayer... I took it off um, a book on one of our fathers of faith in the last century who went to hell three times and um, became born again, served the Lord for maybe five, six decades before he went home to be the Lord. Um, you can call him one of our big fathers of a faith movement, someone for whom I and a lot of us have tremendous respect for. Somebody that God used to establish an understanding of the difference between the soul and the spirit. I mean, through him, his, God helped him, God used him to teach the entire body the distinction between the soul and the spirit. If you read the Old Testament, you find that in the Old Testament, there is the distinction between the spirit and the soul is not very clear. You know, the soul and the spirit are used interchangeably. And even in the soul, we just didn't have a clear understanding of the soul. Through him, God made us understand that the soul comprises the will, the intellect, and the emotions. Great man. So I'm saying he's a great man, did a great work for the Lord. But you see, what you see on these two sides, you see one sinner's prayer. And so what is that sinner's prayer? When people have come and they want to give their lives to God, this first part. So on the left is the one I took from that book. This second is the other one. It says, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, him that cometh to me, I will know I cast out. From John 6, 37. So I know you won't cast me out, but you take me in and thank you for it. Excellent. Perfect. Talking about the fact that 
Christ will always accept he who comes to him. The second one is also exactly like that. There is no difference. There, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, him that cometh to me, I will know why it's cast out. So I know you won't cast me out, but you take me in and I thank you. So that first part is talking about the fact that God is eager. God has no desire for the death of the sinner, but wants them to come to the Lord. So that's, the, I mean, there's an agreement. The second um, 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 paragraph, there is also an agreement. Still re-emphasizing that the fact that God wants to welcome, welcome us. He says, you say in your word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 13, I'm calling on your name so I know you will save me now. It's exactly the same thing with the second one. The second one says exactly the same thing because in Romans 10, 13, God says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm calling on you now, I shall be saved. So those first two things are in agreement. Is when we get to the next paragraph that there is an important distinction. If you go to the next slide, in the next paragraph, so you see that the prayer we pick from um, this book from our father, and it's very common with what is done commonly, he moves from that and he starts to talk about the confession of faith and believe unto righteousness. That's what he moves straight into. So he says, you also said, if, I mean, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification and I confess him now as my Lord. Now, this is, this paragraph is where there is an important need for a change. Not in terms of the fact that the paragraph is not relevant, but there is something omitted which is important. And that thing which is omitted is what we saw when you move to the other prayer. The other prayer now, instead of going straight to Romans 10, 9 and 10, picks one verse. And you can get many verses like that. It picks Acts 17, 30. It says, your word also declares that the times of ignorance, God has winged that, but now it commands all men everywhere to do what? To repent. You see, the other prayer, which I recommend, does not diminish the importance of the same problem. Even though the greatest righteousness of a man is not enough to save him, the sin problem is a real problem. If there was no sin problem, Jesus would not need to die. The reason why Adam fell was disobedience, and all disobedience is sin. The fact that all of our efforts cannot save us does not mean that we should diminish the importance of the sin problem. So this prayer now says, I have lived a life of sin. Satisfy my pleasures often without remorse. From today, I choose to live for, live for you. I will strive and do my best to live righteously. I will avoid, I will hate, and I will abhor sin as you help me. Then he says, I cannot do this. I can't please you in my strength. So Lord Jesus, cleanse me from all sin and come into my life as Lord. Empower me to live for you. A Sinners, leading sinners to Christ in a way that diminishes the sin problem. What happens is it is very, very possible for this person to come to Christ without feeling any compulsion, any, any need to strive to live right. Because Living wrong and living right was totally was made to appear totally irrelevant to the process of accepting the Lord. So it then goes to if you go to the next slide, this one goes on and says, Because your word says, with the heart, man believeth to righteousness. I do believe in my heart. I have now become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I am saved. Thank you. And this is true. But you know what this sinner's prayer? We call it the sinner's prayer. Isn't it? Um, ironic that there is a sinner's prayer that does not mention the word sin at all.
Listen, this prayer is copied verbatim from a small pamphlet of one of our leading lights. And I take nothing away. I mean, a lot of the things I know, I learned it from that our great father in the Lord who's gone on. It's not, I don't take anything away from, but I'm saying, this thing that we call the new convert's prayer or the sinner's prayer, it does not mention the problem of sin once. I have not seen a doctor that does an excellent work of healing if he does not rightly talk about the problem and diagnose it. You should worry if you go to a doctor and you just sit down and he says, I'm going to, die. I'm going to give you um, three doses of aspirin, three doses of... You say, what is wrong with... It? He says, don't worry. I will give you this. So, this sinner's prayer has not mentioned... And so, that paragraph is the key difference. Because after that paragraph, this now also moves to the power of confession. And like, it says... So, it now says, you also said that if I will confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe in my heart Jesus Christ is the son of God. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification and I confess him now as my Lord. The last slide. He just repeats exactly the same. The last slide, please. And he says, because your word says with the heart man believes and I do believe I'm now saved I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus people of God, I'm saying, and I believe, I'm saying it by the Spirit of God, that the deletion of that in the sinner's uh, prayer leads to a major deformity at birth. You know why? Because it, that prayer, it's not just a prayer. It's a prayer that shows you how a lot of the evangelical messages that we preach have changed. Let me tell you, take you back a few decades. You see, a few decades ago, we lacked knowledge. We didn't understand the difference between right standing and right doing or right living. The Bible says in Exodus, there is no one that is perfect and sin it not. Every man, there, it does not matter how, how long you've been born. There is no, so, so yes, the only reason why we stand is by the mercies of Christ. Decades ago, when we got born again, because we didn't understand the difference between right living and right doing, we didn't know that it was just that the grace of God that brought us into Christ was, all, was independent of our works. So anytime we made a mistake, we felt that maybe we were not yet born again. That was one extreme. The other extreme, it, but we were in no doubt that man has a problem of sin that Jesus came to cure. Are we together? The problem now, so in those days, when a message of salvation was going to be preached, if we typically had a crusade, if we, I mean, and on campus, we will have crusades. Our crusades could be a crusade, it could be a, a whole week, usually when um, we used to have in October, when the boys are moving out, they used to call it October Rush. They want to get all the uh, new, new jambas or new girls as girlfriends. We also will have our own um, programs. We wanted to get as many saved as possible. We'll have a drama night. I mean, I was in the drama group. We'll sing. I mean, I mean we'll get speakers from, from town. In those days, when a typical person came to preach, he reminded you about the kind of life, the typical life a sinner lives. They will tell you about those who are drunkards, about those who are um, um, those who are living in immorality and all of that. Then they will tell you that about, you need Jesus Christ to save you. You see, we then also graduated to let them know that even if you are not doing all those things, you still needed Christ. That will have been the place to create a balance. You know why? Because at that point, when the sinner is coming, com any doubt that God hates sin, and that the believer who is coming to accept Christ must come determined to live above sin. Are you with me? 
we then moved to this type of prayer. And it's not only the type of prayer, it is usually the message that precedes it. That message is not only the prayer that does not mention sin. The message is also just keep over sin, as if sin is not important. They say Jesus came and died for you, and it is true. And they say with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, you see, when you preach that message, and then you also say a prayer that does not mention the same problem, you have not sowed a seed. The seed of birth of that new believer has not created any aversion or reversion of hatred or desire to live above sin. And you know one thing about sin or about righteousness? You don't get righteous if you, don't hungry for, if you are not hungry for it. So Matthew chapter 6, I mean chapter 5, the Sermon of the Month, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall what? They shall be filled. If you don't hunger, it, the part of the importance of the salvation message is to create a decision to walk away from the life that is being lived and to create a hunger and a thirst to become a different person. And to say, I will hold on to Christ until he makes me that person. When this message that does not speak about the importance of overcoming sin, even, even though that is not what primarily makes, you see, the, the, the thing about balance, a balance is what makes two seemingly contradictory concepts. He holds them together and they are in balance. Because somebody may listen and say, eh, am I saved by works? No, you are not saved by works, but works are important. So that's what we saw last week. I hope everybody, I hope we're clear and we're on this same page. Now, so this is what is the, um, this is what creates the deformity at birth. It is now also reinforced by a culture of very accommodative sin lifestyle. Because it's not only that the guy said the prayer, the guy is used to a culture where Christians are living anyhow. It is a deformity. But Unlike doctors that struggle with deformity, God is the ultimate healer. So that deformity is curable. But the thing about the cure is that a, if a doctor forces a patient to come for treatment that does not want to be treated, that doctor will be breaking the law. Praise the Lord. Are we together? Yes, now, so that's... that's the important thing, the, the reason why this is important is that, you see, a, a, a core scripture, a core scripture that this inaccuracy or error and cause on is that Romans 10, 9, and 10. That says, Romans 10, 9, and 10, where it says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You know what we've not asked ourselves is that, what does it mean when it says that with the heart man believes unto righteousness? What does it mean to believe unto righteousness? That word righteousness, and I know we don't need to worry ourselves with the Greek. That word righteousness is a, is a that word. Is not that, that word righteousness, it does not only refer to right standing, it combines right standing with right doing. So when he says that with the heart, man believes on the right, he's saying that the sinner has come to a point where he says, I need to live right. But I cannot do it in my own strength. I need Christ. But Christ also needs me for me to do it. It does not depend only on Christ, and it does not depend only on me. That's the balance. You check that word um, um, righteousness. Some of the things it means, it says whatever is right or just in itself. It says it's a combination of both right standing and so I mean some of the things it says whatever is right or just in itself. So it then refers to Matthew 5, 6. It says blessed are they we do hunger and thirst. So when you know, you know when a baby is born with some um, a kind of you know that I remember my mom. My mom said my late sister 
One of the problems that she was shocked, that was her first child. And she just had no appetite. My little sister had no appetite for breast milk. She just didn't want to eat. When you have given birth to a child and you have destroyed the taste buds for righteousness, you have created a problem. You have given birth to a new Christian in a way that the taste buds for righteousness have been squashed. That's the problem. And that is what we need to cry. Another thing he means, he said, whatever has been appointed by God to be acknowledged and obeyed is part of that word righteousness. You know, so even things that appear unimportant, but God wants it to be. So that word righteousness includes things like when Jesus, it refers to Matthew 3.15. Matthew 3.15, when Jesus came for baptism. And John the Baptist said, no, you don't need to be baptized. He said, suffer it to be so for now. For let us fulfill what? All righteousness. It also talks about the total requirements of fulfilling God's kingdom. It is in that righteousness. Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and the seven mountains. You know that theory of the seven mountains that we Christians are going to take over. You know why we have not taken over and we will not take over? We want to seek God's kingdom. We don't want to seek his righteousness. The Christian platform for taking over wherever you are is the righteousness of God. That's the power of God. It's not your first platform is righteous. What is the first thing you think? What, are, what is one of the first things you think about when you think about God? What's the difference between Satan and God? Apart from uh, Heavenly Father, have mercy. Do you know that Satan is powerful? Let me tell you something. God is all powerful. Yes, sir. But Satan is powerful. So, for example, when I was telling people about what is going on in our country, you know, and please, don't, I'm not a politician for whatever you want to think. You know, I, I wrote something and I said, some people are saying that one of the reasons why we should believe that the president is selected by God is because the president actually really defied a lot of odds to become president. All manner of things were put on his way. Currency exchange, uh, who will become um, candidate, you know, all, a lot of those things. And he, he is as if he pulled all this stuff. So I told him that the fact that somebody defies all odds does not mean it's from God. Because God, I, I, I said, God is all powerful, but Satan is powerful, also powerful. So the fact that something very difficult happens does not mean it's God that did it. It can be God, it can be the devil. So I was just talking about that. You see, the reason why that righteousness includes seeking for the kingdom and what is righteous. So we have Christians who are in telecommunications, they're in communications, they're in sports, they're in media, they're in all of those things. But we're not going there with the righteousness of God. As long as we don't go there with righteousness, we'll be talking about those hills and those mountains forever. We can't take over. I was saying to you that, you know one of the things, what, a major thing that separates God from Satan is that God is righteous, Satan is not. You can't say Satan isn't powerful. In fact, when Satan told Jesus, I will give you all of this kingdom. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say you can't. Jesus only said, I won't take it from you. I won't bow to you to get it. I will conquer you to get it. If my father doesn't give it to me, I don't need it. So, it's, that righteousness is it's important. And then it includes religious duties. You know, I've told you, this is included, number one, it includes whatever is right. It includes whatever God has appointed, even if it is ceremonial. It includes all the requirements of, of possessing God's kingdom. It includes religious duties. And you see those religious duties in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 1 up to 15, when you get to the Lord's Prayer. So those religious duties will include things like arms. How do you do your arms? Do it without any other, with, the, with your left, nothing from your right. It includes prayer. And on prayer and formula for confession, because of time, I'm going to come back to something that we need to, when we, when we start talking about, about, um, about, about, about the lips, you know. So, it is this fact that this righteousness, when you say, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. You see, when you look at this picture of righteousness, you find that that phrase, with the heart, man believes to righteousness, you can summarize it in one word. That the man actually, or you can summarize it with this phrase, 
a man genuinely repents. That's what it means when he says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. What that scripture is saying is that the man that is going to come to confess is a man that has made up his mind, that is, he wants to be a man that will, whose life will please God. And I want to thank God for feedbacks. You know, one of the fe- there are two feedbacks. One feedback for me was very serious encouragement. The other one was revelation and learning for me. You know, the first about serious encouragement was because I didn't take his permission. I won't mention his name. If I ask, if I ask him, he will endorse. You know, he's one of us our fathers of faith in Nigeria. In fact, you know, this man that I said has gone home to be the, with the Lord. This is our father of faith based in Ibadan. Used to collect his materials. They would send his materials and they would distribute it all over Nigeria. I mean, um, um, he called me and he said, Okola, I think God showed you what you are teaching. I've listened to it and that was an encouragement. But you know, the second thing was a, a, a senior of mine, distant cousin of mine, also called me. He listened in on, 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 on Zoom. And he said, Kola, you know what? God always directs us to information. He said, Kola, what you are trying to teach he said the Yoruba word for repentance captures it perfectly. He said English doesn't do justice to the word repentance. He said, he said the Yoruba word for repentance graphically takes the word from the Greek and Hebrew and gets it. Ironu ba iwada. In Yoruba, Ironu means I have reflected, I have thought deeply. And because I have reflected and thought deeply, my Manner of life. That's what it means to repent. You see, that is why when you tell a man to come and just confess faith and accept Christ, and he has, you've not taken him through a process of reflecting and saying, murder is bad. And the man has not counted the cost. The man steals 10 million from Nigeria every week based on the kind of contracts he signs. He's, he's not taught his... He is just told that Jesus died for your sins. He will clean your sins. Come as you are. Come as you are. Don't go as you are. (laughs) You know, when we tell people to come as they are, without letting them know that you are not supposed to go as you are. That's That's the problem. The problem is not come as you are. The problem is as you are coming, you know, there are things you are living at the feet of Jesus. You know? So, and so that's, that's the word repentance. And then, you know, in the course of the week, I ran again into a six-minute um, um, recording of Derek Prince. And what my friend told me about Ironupa Iwada, he now also explained it in Greek and Hebrew. You know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. He said both. He said you need to take both together to understand the word repent. Exactly the same thing. That in the Greek, it makes you think about a reflection that leads to a change of mind, to a, to a change of life. And the Hebrew um, will make you think of a change in lifestyle. This wasn't strange 40 years ago when some of us were giving our lives to Christ. In fact, not enough of understanding of grace was there. All they made us think was, all, all the message was all about the things we need to stop. You must stop this, you must stop that, you must stop this, you must stop that. So, I mean, when you get out of the door and the things you are trying to stop is not, is clinging to you, you say, it must be that I have not yet born again. Mulati born again, again. But that's not it. But we then shouldn't move to the, so that, this is what creates the, that, that's why, you, a, a baby born normally must come out crying. And after a short while, must be hungry for the mom's breast. When that is not the case, there is a problem. As I said again, the problem we've created is that we have squashed. We, get, we bring people to the Lord in a way where we squash and destroy the thirst and the hunger for righteousness. And righteousness is not cheap. You don't become righteous if you are not hungry, if you are not thirsty. And so that's why, like I said, in those days, we'll get born again. Sometimes people will weep. Sometimes people will be waiting. They want to see the pastor after. 
they will tell the pastor all the shigiti in the different corners of their houses, as was the case in Acts. The Bible talks in, about in Acts. It said people went and brought out all of their magical acts. But these days, because we just told them, we have taken away repentance. We have now said it's just a confession of faith. So people just straddle. They just, uh, you know, they just bounce as if, um, you know, they just bounce forward, you know. And, and as, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I told you, the word repent is so important. It's one of the first things John the Baptist said. In Matthew chapter, he said repent. In Matthew chapter 4, it's the first thing that Jesus said. In Acts chapter 2, is the first thing the apostles um, said. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, I told, I told you about the, the men that Jesus met. A man like um, um, Zacchaeus. The man didn't only say, Jesus, come into my house. When Jesus said, come into my house, he said, Jesus, come into Jesus said, I will come to your house. If you read about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1 to 10. But he now said, Jesus, I'm going to. He didn't use those same words. He said, now I've repented. What did he say? He said, if I've taken anything wrongly, I will restore fourfold. He said, and I'm going to give half of my goods. Jesus now said, he said, hey, I'm not only coming to your house, I'm coming to your life. He said, salvation has come to your house. That's what happened. In John chapter 8, when that woman was caught in adultery, and, go, and Jesus said, he who has not committed sin, throw what? The first stone. When everybody left, he didn't say, he didn't say go. He said go, and what? And sin no more. That's repentance. If you read about Levi, Levi is a man called Matthew. Matthew was also a, a, he was a criminal tax collector. Do you know what happened? When Jesus called him, the Bible records that he left everything. Not some. If you read in, in Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verse 27 to 32, the Bible says, so Matthew left everything, sprang up and went with him. So what I want to say to you is that, you see, the challenge, the danger of this deformity, listen, hear me very well. The danger of this deformity eh, is that the risk of a Christian that remains sinful, carnal, and worldly, hear me, is the sin of, is the risk of spiritual death. From time to time, Romans 8 from verse 1 to 16 is a book. There are times I memorize it. It's, it's those, if you can memorize those 16 verses, you should memorize them. But for purpose of today, you know, in Romans chapter 8, I, I want, for, for purpose of this emphasis, I want us to look at, we will look at verse 1, verse 4, verse 12, and verse 13. Romans 8, chapter 1. The Bible says, it says, there is therefore now, praise the Lord. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? He says, they do not walk after the flesh, but they walk after the spirit. That spirit is capital S, the Holy Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they do not walk after the flesh, they walk after the spirit. Now, why is it? In verse 4, he says, the reason why they are walking after the spirit is that the, that the righteousness of the law that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that righteous fulfillment of the law is both the righteousness of right standing and what? Right doing. It's not just a state of being. It says yes. That the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. But it says... We are leaving it out. Who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the spirit. And then crucially, in, I mean, the, 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 one of the commentaries says, that fulfillment is that, that we might be conformed and obedient to all the requirements that God desire, demands. And we are no longer under the influence of the flesh and its corrupt desires. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The risk of these children that we have deprived of this hunger is the risk of spiritual death. 
So in verse 12, it says, therefore, brethren, Romans 8, 12, it says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Verse 13, look at this, verse 13, look at what he says, he's talking to Christians. He's writing to Christians, verse 13 says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Can you hear it? It says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. He said, but if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. To mortify means to put to death. When God was letting the, the Colossians know the importance of life, he said, mortify therefore your members. It's not saying the members of the devil. Put to death your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, adultery, evil concupiscence, and co lasciviousness, and covetousness which is idolatry. Whether you are Pope or Geo or pastor or head of department, it is in you. And it doesn't die because you are born again. It dies because after you are born again, you put it to death. And you only put it to death because... Uh, do you know what they say about a cow? Or Juni Malun Ro? Or Beo Dalonu? To put things inside you, to, to take a knife to things that are inside you that want to be alive, it's not pleasant. You know something I laugh? I laugh because people look at some of us because we are growing older now. They think that we don't see pretty girl, girls. They don't know is that we take our eyes away. You know this make me laugh. They think that we don't get broke. And there is no opportunity to steal money. And your, your mind computes that, ah, we don't need to worry you. But you take your mind away. Put to death. You kill it. If you don't kill it, it will stay alive. And you know the thing is that it doesn't die permanently. It's not like the cow that you killed yesterday and you eat it today. You kill it and you keep killing it. It says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. And you know I checked that word, die. It means not only physical death, it also refers to spiritual death, separation from the life of God, which is where a, an unbeliever was taken from. That is why this deformity needs to be cured. And how do you cure it? You preach the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Set you free. And that is what is leading to something today. I believe the Holy Ghost is going to shake the table. <laughs> that this whole concept, eh? Of confession. What happened eh, is the human being sometimes hates hard work eh, and loves shortcuts. Hates hard work and, and does what? Loves shortcuts. Love simplicity. And the reality is that not all things in the world are simple. Some things take hard work. You see, after a, a season, a generation when um, we didn't quite understand grace, and we were wondering, ah, ah, is it so hard to become born again? I was simply because we didn't understand grace. Now, we now started to understand grace. Instead of staying at the balance of understanding grace, eh, we now started, Satan started to plant in people's mind what seemed very attractive, how to reduce God to formulas. How to reduce what God to what? To formulas. And God is not a formula. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him, not in formula and truth. They must worship him in spirit and in truth. The reason why we are moving to this second part, which is very important, is, you see, in the course of looking for how do we make this thing, how do we 
capture it. You want to capture it beyond how God has asked us to capture it. Eh? One of the things that came was an introduction. There is a big theology, a big idea around confession. Hear me. Confession is important. What I'm about to say is important. It's about to pass. And I've said this before. Look around in this church. Our church has two colors, if I'm correct. There is white that is on top and there is gray. Listen to me. God sent me to tell you this and you need to get it. So that I don't miss it, I want to go to my room. Let me tell you, people think that error, error is only what is outrightly wrong. That's not true. You see, error is not only what is outrightly wrong. There are three or four other things that are error. You see, error includes Severe underemphasis of what is important. That is also error. I'll give you an example. You see, a mother, a mother who doesn't find a way to tell her daughter. Now, she sees the mother, she behaves well, she respects the dad. It will never even cross her mind that her mom will be unfaithful to the dad, but doesn't tell the daughter that see, you are now going, you are leaving school, you are leaving home, you are going to school. Not all men are like your dad, though. Not all those boys in your class or in your school who are brought up in the same kind of home you are brought. There are those who are looking for girls like you to take advantage of. You see. That is an underemphasis that is erroneous. That kind of girl has not been prepared for how to react when someone comes and says, well, I, help, I help you to get a chair for this lecture. And says, I bought you this flower. Says, you are the most special thing that happened. Her head starts to spin. Say, even my dad doesn't talk to me like that. This boy is... Some of the things some of us will have done. Eh? I was in Enugu. About 600, 700 kilometers. When somebody is saying something, I will be hearing my mom's voice. <laughs> She's not there. No, I was already grown up. She, I mean, I don't think, I, as stubborn as I was, by the time, I don't, I don't think I was caned any time after I was 11. Though that caning till 11 is more than what some people <laughs> is enough for for life. <laughs> You know, that is, you'll be hearing your mom's voice saying, Kola, run to your mind, iti wanshe, ma buru komije. Do you, so, let me come back to this, I want you to notice it, see, eh? there are things which are blatantly erroneous, that's one dimension of error. Note this, error is also on the emphasis of what is accurate. Error is also excessive emphasis that leads to distortion. Let me give you an example of under emphasis. In church, we always remind you to pay your tithe. We never remind, we hardly ever remind you to take care of your parents. It is an underemphasis that is erroneous. A Christian can feel very comfortable if he's not careful with just taking bare care of the parents. It's not as if we tell you that you shouldn't take care of your parents. But we don't tell you that the Bible requires that honor your father and your mother. That word honor includes substance, includes in includes glamour, includes all that you are. Do you see how underemphasis can be a problem? Underemphasis is expecting 
a boy to just behave like his father without letting him know that in this Osho, the way we are living, you know, our boy is a Mubo. Do, do you understand? It is letting a girl know, even when Zazo thinks that, <coughs> that the mom is weak at that. Uh, that that dembe. Go, say, go, go, all those, all those, all those, all those, all those boys. Go, go and follow them. Go and follow them. Go and follow them. Those, those things are right emphasis. Just also as excessive emphasis. Let me give you one an excessive emphasis. Like I used to tell you, you know, if I tell you that this wall is white, it is correct. If I tell you that the wall is very white. It's also probably correct. It's an opinion. You may think, even if you don't think it's very white, you should be gracious to say, okay, pastor think it's very white. You know what is not a problem? If I tell you that this is the whitest wall in the world. Now, can you see this wall? In fact, if a wall is not white like this wall, it, listen, I've seen this in life. There are, there are one or two men I have tremendous respect for. God has showed them one way to pray. God showed them one way to pray. And that way to pray is very effective. So he moves from this way to pray is very effective. Then it becomes every time we are praying, we must we pray like that. It's just a progression. Then it gets to a point where they say, if you don't pray like this, your prayer will not be effective. Can you see how you move, how you move from this wall is white to this is the only white wall in the world? That is what error is. And I'm, I'm want to beg to say today that, you see, that entire, <coughs> somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Are we together? Yes, I'm talking about confession versus states of the heart. Confession is important. But the state of the heart is more important than confession. Because you can confess. There are people who confess what they don't mean. They are lying. They are hypocrites. Can you hear me? Confession, we have, the current confession theology is inaccurate. Let me read something which I want you to write down. And I'm going to read it again later. Key takeaway. Confession theology. take away confession theology. The confession theology of the faith movement needs rebalancing. The confession theology of the faith movement needs rebalancing. Because in its present state it is erroneous. The confession theology of the faith movement needs rebalancing. Because in his present state, it is erroneous. It is erroneous because it reduces the root to possession of our inheritance in God. Let me repeat that again. It is erroneous because it reduces the root to possession of our inheritance in God or obtaining answers to our prayers to a formula. Did you get that? It is erroneous because it reduces the root to possession of our inheritance in God or obtaining answers to prayers to a formula. Did you get that? The second error is that it encourages Christians to deploy a significant part of their energies to material, financial, and worldly success. The second error is that it encourages Christians 
to deploy a significant part of their energies to material, financial, and worldly success. Did you get that? The objective of most of these confessions, the objective of most of these confessions are worldly goods. Maybe as much as 80% or more. Not a heavenly estate. You know what the Bible says in Colossians? If Christ is your life, seek those things that are in heaven where Christ is, not the things which are on earth. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you appear within you what? In glory. Okay. It says, this, the popular emphasis on confession is erroneous and needs to be changed. I mean, we'll take it again. So let me, as I said, eh, it's not that confession is not important. So I can quickly go through four verses that shows confession is important. You know, one major scripture of the faith movement is Mark 11, 22 to 24. Are we together? You know when Jesus had cursed that fig tree and then the next day, when they were coming, Peter said, ah, master, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday is withered. And then he says, in Mark chapter 11, the Bible, verse 22, he said, Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. And let me tell you how this thing is now, I, I it is, is, is taught. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. You know how this scripture is explained? Is explained that in this scripture about faith, there are five says or saith, and two belief or doubt. And so, some will tell you that you need two and a half times more confession than you need believing. Because when you actually look at that verse, you will count say or saith five times. Doubt occurs once, believe occurs once. Let, but yes, so this scripture shows that confession is important, isn't it? If you look at Proverbs 12, 14, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14, it says, A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. A man shall be satisfied with good by what? The fruit of his mouth. Confession is important. In Proverbs 18, 20 to 21, the Bible says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. There is no doubt that confession is important. Then Job says, Thou, in 20, Job 22, 28 to 29, he says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and what? It shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. When men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there is what? There is a lifting up. See, confession is important. The problem is a problem of context and emphasis. Until you get to university, or you have decided to do arts, eh? There are some subjects you can afford to ignore. You can't afford to ignore mass. They are all subjects. And the teachers may even be paid the same thing. But if you ignore maths, even if you pass jam, you may forfeit your jam. Emphasis is important. That's the work, the work of teaching is to let us know the appropriate emphasis of things and where we have missed things. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know that in our generation, the last 30 years, the emphasis on confession is almost like five to ten times the emphasis on this condition of the heart. 
And confession does not automatically change the confession of the heart, the state of the heart. The face of the heart is sort of all your will, what you have made up your mind to do or not to do. Then after that, you now store the word in your heart. Let the word of God dwell richly in you. It's, out, it's when you have done that, out of the abundance of the heart, the man will now speak. So while the Bible says all of these things about the mouth, I have looked, looked, and I've seen that there is a level of emphasis, of gravity, that as important as confession is, there is a gravity that God puts with the state of the heart. That even as important as God says confession is, God does not put it with confession. So for example, God says in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 and 10. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. He says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He doesn't say, I, the Lord, search the mouth. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. He doesn't say, I tried the mouth. He says, I, the Lord, tried the reins of the heart. He says, it's only when I've seen your heart, I will give to every man according to his ways. Do you, do you start to see where the, where the emphasis can be misplaced? Anytime you see try the heart, the living Bible says, is, I, I, the, the living Bible usually says it is that God examines your deepest motives. It doesn't, doesn't look at actions. That, that scripture, living Bible says, only the Lord knows the heart. He searches all hearts and examines the deepest motives. Look at Psalm 7, verse 9. Psalm 7, verse 9. He says, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God tried the hearts and the reins. The living Bible says, examine the deepest motives. In Psalm 26, verse 1, it says, judge me, O Lord. I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. But when he's saying, judge me, he says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try the reins of what? Of my heart. One of the problems of Saul that David did here, David's heart was right with God. So when God will look deep down in David's motives, David, God will see a man whose heart feared God. I mean, Saul had made a mistake. What was he telling Samuel? Honor me in front of the people. David was saying, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. If you like, you can take this empire away from me. But do what? Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. You see, it is this kind of heart eh, that will make and I hope it doesn't happen, one or two of my sons eh, to go on Friday night or Saturday night to play music in a place that the Holy Spirit cannot enter. That is, if the Holy Spirit, God, thank God, the Holy Spirit never makes mistakes. If the Holy Spirit was mistaken that because you were going there, I wanted to accompany you. When he peeps inside, like he says, ah! Kilo wash him, eh? And the Holy Spirit will turn back. The heart won't even know that somebody turned back. They may play in that place from Saturday till 4 a.m., go home, have a shower. And God may organize it that, that I was just coming to church. I was coming to church. I said, oh, pastor, God oh, bless you. The state of the heart. The heart is what? Desperately wicked. And God does not want to agree with desperately wicked hearts. Jeremiah eleven twenty 20 says, God tries the reins of the earth. Let me tell you the punchline. For you to know about the importance of the heart. In Matthew chapter 15. Please take this, Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 to 9. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is what? Is far from me. 
in vain do they worship me. Let me tell you, a confession-based faith life that is not on the foundation of a heart of reverence is false worship. He says, in vain do they what? And we have created a 30 years, a 35 years, a 40 years, where the emphasis on confession is disproportionate to the emphasis on the state of the heart. Because we were looking for formula. Do you know what we reduced faith to? There is, have you heard about something? When, we were, when, we found that, when they found that formula, they shared it with us. They call it the ABC of faith. Do you know what the ABC of faith is? A is ask. B is believe. C is confess. Ask, believe, confess. Formula. Then you'll be told that after you've asked and you've believed, confession brings possession. I haven't you heard it before? Confession. If you like, go and tell Tinumbu. Confession. God, you can't reduce God to formula. God is a relational God. The way God wants to talk to Auntie Stella and he talks to her is different from the way he talks to Zee. It's different from the way he talks to you. It's different from the way he talks to me. And for us to understand that that is how he made it, there are no two um, fingerprints that are the same. You see, as, as you are listening to me now, five, six people are hearing different things from the Lord. God is taking the same word. And what he's saying to Dotu is different from what he's saying. We now want to reduce it to formula. Ask. Believe. Confess. Then you continue confessing. Because what? Confession will bring possession. Many of us, many of us are poor. We have not possessed anything. So that's why I say to you, see, this, the confession theology, and you know one thing, that I saw a scripture. You need to write that scripture down. Powerful scripture on prayer. The message captures it. Matthew 6, chapter 7 and 8. You know, you don't get the picture very well from here when he says, uh, uh, don't be like people who use vain repetitions. Do you, the, do you know what he says? Matthew 6, 7, 8. He says, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. Can you hear? He says, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. He says, they are full of formulas and programs and advice. Peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. That's what message says. It gives you the picture. And you know, you know why this is it? How many miracles did Jesus tell people, go and be confessing, go and be confessing. We will possess it. The John 21, 25, the last scripture in John says that if they were to document all the things that Jesus did, he said all the books in this world will not contain it. He said, but in the scriptures, depending on who is counting, we have between 35 and 40 miracles. I just want to give you an example of three. See, in Luke 17, 11 to 19, when God wanted to um, um, heal the, the, some lepers, what did he say? Luke 17, 11, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, as they were going. Another example, in when Peter's mother was ill, I don't know where, where Catholics discovered that people who are having God should not have wives. Even with the wives, it is hard enough. Even with the wife, it is hard enough to walk the narrow, straight and narrow way. They will now say there is no wife. That is why, see, confusion won't stop uh, in anywhere where people put the rules of men to override the rule of God. There will always be abortion. There will be all manner of of Harakiri and confusion going on. 
So teacher, he went to Peter's mother-in-law. They say he was sick with a fever. The Bible says he just took her hand and lifted her up. Why did he say, go and show yourself to Peter? Maybe he told the, the, the leper. Another, another, one, another time, there were some blind men at Bethesda. I mean, one blind man at Bethesda. He, the man, he met the man. He left him blind. He took him outside the city. Took him to the outskirts of the city. Then he mixed, sorry for my, I'm a Yoruba boy. English people call it phlegm. Yoruba people call it kelebe. He took his spittle. He mixed it with sand and rubbed it on his eyes. Then he said, do you see? The man said, I see men like trees. Then he touched his eyes again. Do you know what the, do you know what is the common strength? It is not confession. It is relationship with God. You know why it is relationship with God? Write this down. In John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 5, verse 19. The Bible says, But Jesus answered them, My father walks hitherto, and I walk. Therefore, the Jews sought more to kill him. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father. Then he said, look at verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I said to you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the father do. Those things, what, those are the things he also does. You know how the living Bible puts it? He said, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing and in the same way. Let me give you an example. Do you know that the blind, the lame man that Peter and John healed, the Bible says they used to lay him at the gate of the temple. The man was there all the time Jesus was passing. Do you know why Jesus has not healed him? God said it's not his time. Jesus didn't change it with confession. He says, what I see my father do, that I what? The foundation of a work of faith is relationship. Deep, intimate relationship. Not formula. Go and read that Matthew um, 6, 7 and 8 again in the message. It says there are many so-called prayer warriors who are really prayer ignorant. Who want to reduce God to formula. That is why, you see this confession, confession is important, but it's not by formula. It is the state of our heart that is much more important. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. The Bible says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place and prayed. Do you get it? He had gone to pray. Then Simon and the rest followed after him. I hope you will not be following far behind him. You will follow with him. He says, After he had prayed, when they found him, they said unto him, All men are looking for you. You see, if Jesus had not prayed, you know what he would say? Say, Where are they? He said, all men are looking. What will be the next logical question? Where are they? I want to know what see. You know, men must be careful. Uh, Pastor Joshua, we had one meeting here. One of my friends called me in VI. He looked at it. He said, he said I, ah, I have a hall. Let's start a branch on the island. I said, with all the churches on the island. I said, do we really need it? <laughs> He said, hey. I said, yeah. I said, yes. I said, why do we need? I said, why do we need a why do we need a church on the island? Many times, eh? Men will be calling you. You will think it's God. Sometimes God will be calling you. You will think it's men. Like Samuel. God called him, he will run to Eli. Excuse me, are you like with me? <laughs> God saved Samuel. Eli, with all of Eli's weakness, Eli wasn't a wicked man. All Eli needed to say, don't worry. If you hear, you just be sleeping. <laughs> so Jesus, because Jesus had prayed, he had a he knew that no, those people are good. But that's not what God said. You know what Jesus said? He said, He said, and when they had found him, they said unto him, all men see. And he said to them, let us go to the next towns. 
It was in that place we want to take me. No, that's not where I have seen what God wants me to. That's not what he's doing for today. Let's go elsewhere. So I will say to Ross, eh? you know, the priorities of our confession, when we get it right, eh? the, the first priority of our confession will be worship. It will be to exalt and to magnify God. Say one, worship. You know what the second will be? The second will be sanctification. So you know, young men all across our campuses who are struggling with these drugs, the confession they will be looking for will be the scriptures that will break the hold of the drug. People, wives, whose mouths can drive 150 kilometers per hour in abusing their, their husband, they will look for, for scriptures that will sanctify their lips, that will say, be slow to speak, be quick to hear, slow to wrath. Say the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. There are things we share on the men's forum that it can be misunderstood if we share it generally. I saw one, <laughs> one video. They slapped one man. <laughs> you see, in that slap, I shared it with the men. So I told them that they should take it to what Sister Kemi said. People should not carry anger. That you may think you may think you know how to be angry. You see, you see, one man was he was intimidating another man. He didn't know that that man had a special <laughs> that that his area of specialization was dirty slap. You see, when he gave him a dirty slap, he was holding his head like this. <laughs> you know. So what I was saying is that you have a temper. The Bible talks about not being a brawler. There are, you see, all the things that men struggle with, there are scriptures that address it. Confession is not just about possession of money. It's possession of the character of God. So, maybe there is a woman that is on Facebook or Zoom. Brother Joshua, some husbands have grace. That is, so if they, there is a way, some wives don't need to talk. When they just look at you. Yes, sir. You know, some men who don't like to pray, their usual prayer time is between seven and nine when they are going home. <laughs> When they just remember I'm going home, they had to do that. <laughs> and then there are some very irresponsible. All those things are in the scripture. I remember one of my late, one of my um, mentees. She's gone home to be with the Lord now. Said the last day her husband beat her was the day she said enough of this nonsense, and she turned around. She broke a bottle. Said the man there is no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the man said, the man said, it's enough. <laughs> he said, he just discovered that that was the lie. <laughs> I mean, all those things, you know. So the next confession is sanctification. Then the third is consecration. See, God didn't call us to possess everything our eyes and our ears will see. Do you know something about Jesus? John sent, John the Baptist, his first cousin who he loved, sent a message to Jesus. Are you he that is to come? Or should we expect another? Do you know why Jesus didn't lift a finger? God had told him, leave him. That's his journey with me. Jesus was so pained when John was beheaded. He left all his disciples. He went alone to mourn. Don't be like some, don't be a Christian that is like some of these silly people who say they want to be governor, who have not done any work anywhere except to open a house and be telling us that they build their house so that the car can park in the sitting room. A man who has never done any work apart from being in the house of rep and being in Senate, own three or four, I mean, the things that in other places, shame. It's not, 
Jesus didn't come and die so that we will all become rich. So you know what consecration is? Consecration is that you subject the choices you want to make to God. That's the purpose. And then the last before prosperity now comes. When prosperity then comes, some people are shaking their head. When prosperity then comes, that prosperity is in line with the word of God. God is not a formula. Before I shut down and take one or two um, questions, I want to read this scripture again. Matthew 6, 7, and 8, the message. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are, who are prayer ignorant. They are full of formulas and programs and advice. Peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with. And he knows better than you what you need. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not about formula. It's about relationship. The heart, the state of the heart is infinitely more important than the confession of the mouth. Confession is important, very important. But it comes way behind the state of the heart. And our current confession theology, we need to substitute it for sanctification theology, for consecration theology, for holiness theology, for submission theology. It is only then that our heart... heart you cannot use prayer to blackmail God. Even Jesus couldn't blackmail God. God, change your mind. I don't want to die. Say, okay, I can't force you. If you don't want to die, don't die. But I want you to die. Just let us agree. Let's make it very clear. You, you are not, if Jesus couldn't blackmail God with intercession, who are you? <laughs> who are you to think that you can black, that you want to use prayer? God will tell you, God will allow that you can do what you want. Eh? But just know that it is what you want. Uh, isn't that what we read yesterday, or I mean today, or today's um, me, um, today's passage? Samuel said, "Yes, what you did is bad. God didn't ask you to get a king, but you have got it. However, repent and walk closely with God, you and the king. Praise the Lord. Yeah. May God help us to get our confession theology, not just we related in relation to being born again, in relation to life and walk with God." Let me say it again. I, I believe that one about the auction of the, of the Spirit. You see, worship confession, sanctification confession, consecration confession is much, much more important than possession confession. It's when we have gotten those first three right that our spirits will be sensitive to pick the things we need to confess about the things of the world. It's crucial. And the current confession theology we have is inaccurate and needs rebalancing. Uh, can I take one or two questions before we close? Hallelujah. Any questions? There is, I, can see, I can see a hand behind. I can see Sister Stella. I can see Brother Okay Sinachi. Uh, I also want uh, the, I hope the Zoom, I don't want us to exclude our Zoom audience. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Quick, quick. Okay. I'll take the questions together. Let's take Sister Stella's question. Let's go straight to the point. And then after Sister Stella, you can keep my, 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 my Praise the Lord. Please, uh, I want you to make us to understand about this repentance on you, born again. I could remember in those days when we give our life to Jesus. Before someone's come out for altar call, you will be crying. Even the church will close. You can't go back home. You are afraid to go and see yourself seen again. And when they announced a study about repentance, people will be hungry to come and hear. But now people are running to hear that message. Even men of God will come and warn fellow men of God, say, are you on this silly about repentance? You will stay there and die because nobody will hear you. And 
when they preach of repentance, no one will come out for altar call. Everybody want to sit. So what I want to know, is it the word of God that says that on the end time like this, people will be lover of their saved. They will no more hear the word of God. Or the devil is stronger than God to seize this spirit from humanity. Any question from the Zoom audience? Please get it ready so I can ask. I want to take the question. Praise the Lord. Um, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Sorry, my question is this is this is a Zoom question. Um, I appreciate your message, sir. Repentance is always a turning point in restoring our relationship with God. It is a true measure of spiritual sensitivity and sincerity. Mark 3, verse 29 makes it incapable of repenting for one's transgression, even when the state of the heart yearns for a divine pardon. Sir, kindly clarify this in respect to repentance. Sir, please have to read it again. Okay. Mark 3.29 makes it incapable of repenting for one's transgression, even when the state of the heart yearns for a divine pardon. Sir, kindly clarify this in respect to repentance. I don't get that. When it says Mark 3.29, it does what? He said Mark 3.29 makes it incapable of repenting for one's transgression even when this Okay, so somebody should read the Mark 3.29 for me. That's the... But, but he shall blaspheme, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost and never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Okay, praise God. Okay. So, so no, that's, I've got that. I've got that. Is there any other question? No, that's that. okay. So, can we take the three questions? Okay, uh, or the two questions. Ma, the Bible says that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The things we are seeing should not surprise us. The Bible also has promised us that there, in the last days there will be false. Um, uh, prophets and false teachers. You see, we think that when the Bible talks about false teachers and false prophets, please go on with what I told you. You see, we tend to think that error is what is blatantly erroneous. That's just one third of errors. On the emphasis of truth that needs prominence is error. Over emphasis of truth beyond what it should be projected is also error. So this should not, the only thing we should tell ourselves is that we should not be discouraged. Can we get it? You see, because sometimes, okay, you're a pastor, um, you are preaching repentance, and nobody is listening to you. And now you now, to, you now get tempted to change the message. Don't yield. Don't. Jesus didn't change his pattern of life. He didn't run ahead of time. There was a time, his people were, there was a time, I told you that sometimes men call you. You must know that his men calling you, not God. His brothers called him. They say, if you are, if you know you are, show yourself. <laughs> All these things you are doing. They were calling him. That he knew that they were the ones calling him, not God. He didn't go. So my own change. I'm sorry to tell you, there are chances it will get worse, except we really intercede. And one of the things we need to pray, we need to pray for ourselves. The Bible says, let him that think at his stand, take heed. Let's evolve. So, so let's, let's keep praying, you know. But the scripture also says, oh, that in the midst of all of this that's going on, he said, they that know they are God, they shall be strong and shall do exploits. You know, so we need to be balanced. God is still doing great things and will do great things. Revival will still come. I'm very, very optimistic that in my lifetime, in my lifetime, and I'm no longer a small boy, in my lifetime, the church will be the catalyst for revival in Nigeria. That the church... The, the church, the body of Christ, will conquer corruption in Nigeria. Amen. And once corruption is co conquered, this country is unstoppable. Once we conquer corruption, we are unstoppable. And the church will lead it. You know, so, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not discouraged. You know, I'm not, I'm not disheartened. You know, I'm not. There is, with God, all things are, are possible. And then you know that thing about um, the sin against the Holy Spirit. I thank God the Bible does not say 
the man is in sin or the man is in damnation. They say he's in danger. When you are in danger of something, it means you can avoid it. You see, this thing about the sin against the Holy Spirit is a sin of rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, which is that the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. Anyone that remains in that sin cannot, is in a state of damnation, but the person has not restored himself to Christ. So, I want to ask people, don't let Satan deceive you. Let me know how some people have been deceived. You backslid once. You now want to rededicate your life. Satan will tell you, you have sinned against the Holy Spirit. There is no, there is no forgiveness for you. Don't bother your head. Keep doing what you... No, it, that, that's the voice of the devil. Even somebody listening to me who has sold his soul in the occult and they will be telling you that you cannot abandon the occult, it is not true. He who the soul sets free shall what? Shall be free indeed. If there's no other question, let's bow our heads and just pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, the prayer I pray today is as many as are under the sound of my voice, whether here physically or in the Zoom audience or the Facebook audience, whose experience of accepting Christ is defective because confession of faith was preached without repentance from sin. Lord, as they repent today, Lord, recreate and renew their faith. Perfect their faith. Set them on the path of a healthy walk with you in Jesus' name. And Lord God, for all of us in this congregation, for what you want to do in the body of Christ, we uproot anything that is inaccurate about the current confession theology. And we declare in the name of Jesus that our understanding of the heart and the mouth will be exact, precise, and accurate. Thank you, mighty Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah.